was supposed to uh, do like the translation. So we have. Is, is she coming? Or? Yeah. Okay. 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 Voilà. On va on va continuer. Donc un grand merci encore. Euh, euh, au Centre Librex et euh, au Point Culture. Et donc, euh, comme... Euh, bon, je vais mettre comme ça. Euh, comme vous le savez probablement maintenant que je suis un des représentants de, de genre pluriel, et euh, ce n'est pas pour les, ce qu'on peut appeler, entre guillemets, la communauté trans un jour euh, comme, un, comme un autre, euh, puisque c'est le 20 novembre aujourd'hui, et le 20 novembre pour euh, les personnes trans, c'est ce que l'on appelle le TIDOR, donc le, le, le Transgender Day of Remembrance. C'est un, un jour qui est commémoré depuis euh, quelques années maintenant, depuis 2008. Et c'est une personne aux états unis qui a référencé les meurtres des personnes trans, donc des meurtres spécifiques des personnes trans euh, de par le monde. Et, euh, et cette année, comme malheureusement... Les autres années, il y a eu des 226 meurtres enregistrés euh, de par le monde, euh, spécifiquement en trans. Donc vous imaginez, euh, la réalité, c'est les 226, c'est uniquement le haut de l'iceberg. Alors euh, il y a, et vous pouvez retrouver sur le site de Transgender Europe, qui est un, une plateforme européenne de, de défense de, des personnes trans, euh, la, la map, la, la, carte, la cartographie des meurtres des personnes trans, euh, principalement le nombre de personnes qui ont été assassinées spécifiquement se situe plus dans, en Amérique latine et en Amérique du Sud, on va dire, Amérique centrale et Amérique du Sud, et aussi aux états unis euh, Là c'est vraiment le plus grand gros chiffre de, de, des meurtres. Euh, et ce c'est aussi dans ce cadre-là et dans le cadre de notre festival, euh, notre festival se, se déroule toujours autour du 20 novembre pour cette raison-là. Et nous sommes en plein dans notre festival et c'est pour ça que euh, nous sommes également présents. Euh, et que dans, dans cette vision euh, de savoir un peu, de s'ouvrir un peu sur les existences des autres euh, réalités et des autres... Euh, perspective également au niveau euh, international et au niveau européen. Nous avons invité euh, Victor, qui est euh, membre d'une euh, association trans en Pologne et qui va nous expliquer euh, et nous définir un petit peu la, la situation des personnes trans euh, en Pologne. Je suis désolé, mais je ne parle pas français. <rire> But I, 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 but I bet Aurel will um, deliver a great translation. We worked uh, on this together yesterday, and I think it's going to be perfect. So I hope for those who do not speak English, you will enjoy it. Um, and if you don't speak English, you can just enjoy the um, sound of my voice, if you like it. <laughs> okay, so some people actually understand. That's good. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Jean Plouillet for inviting me here. and. Um, that I can give some highlights on the situation of trans people in Poland. And I know that uh, Poland seems to be very far away from here. So it might be, uh, I know that it's somet sometimes when I, when I present in Western countries, people think that I'm speaking about Russia and all these other uh, weird places, but it's not going to be like that. You will see, but it's going to be um, complicated in terms of the situation. Uh, but I have to say it's um, it's quite difficult to be speaking today uh, on the Transgender Day of Remembrance and that is because uh, there are two events in Warsaw and in Łódź that are happening uh, today in Poland and I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm also uh, I'm happy to be here with you but I'm, uh, I'm also sorry that I cannot be with my own community today uh, as uh, at 6 p.m. we've started our uh, vigil in, in Warsaw. Uh, and the reason uh, uh, the reason why this particular presentation is going to be difficult is not just because of today and the date that we're talking about, but also because uh, the reality of trans people in Poland uh, is 
quite difficult and there's a lot of uh, there's there's a lack of protection from discrimination uh, there's hate crime there's uh, there's hate pe there, there's hate speech there's not much protection from these uh, neither in the law or general practice and the level of protection basically for trans people is one of the lowest in Europe uh, and even though Poland is one of the countries which do not force uh, transitioning persons to uh, to sterilize themselves, it is still very p poor at understanding the everyday reality of trans people and their human rights. Et bien, donc Victor Dinarski remercie les organisateurs pour l'invitation et il va donc nous présenter un aperçu de la situation des personnes transgenres en Pologne. Ce n'est pas sans émotion qu'il s'adresse à vous, car ce 20 novembre est la journée internationale de la mémoire transgenre, et donc Victor ne sera pas aujourd'hui auprès de sa communauté en Pologne, tandis qu'elle rend hommage aux victimes de la transphobie et de la peur des personnes qui ne se conforment pas aux normes binaires de ce que nous appelons le genre. Cette présentation est difficile aussi, car en Pologne, le niveau de protection par rapport aux discriminations, aux discours et aux crimes de haine est l'un des plus bas en Europe. Et bien que ce pays, contrairement à la Belgique, euh, n'exige pas que les personnes trans soient stérilisées, il y a une grande méconnaissance de leur réalité et de leurs droits humains. So in Poland, uh, neither gender expression nor gender identity are understood as discrimination grounds. Uh, and transgender people will very often be left without any legal base to defend their rights. Every person who transitioned and has had experiences with discrimination uh, can file a lawsuit under the ground of sex, but that's only for those who, um, who transition and who, uh, who actually have gone through that process. Uh, the question is what about the people, uh, these trans people who do not wish to transition legally uh, and or medically, uh, but still have, uh, but still like to have their identities and expressions uh, respected. So that is the question that we're dealing with today. Um, currently in Poland, these people do not have any form of protection against possible discrimination, and not to mention instances of, of, of violence or even murder. Uh, so there is no, no protection from violence uh, when you are trans and you are not transitioning. And also trans people face extreme difficulties on the job market in Poland. Um, that includes receiving new, new certificates of employment. So it is impossible after you have transitioned, there is no law that would force your employer to issue a new uh, certificate of employment so you can get a certificate of employment uh, only if you, if you have a nice talk with your employer. There is nothing that will force them to do this. Uh, trans youth are confronted with school bullying. There is there are no policies against it. There is there is no campaign that would not even nothing that the government would do about this. Uh, there is a distinctive lack of general information on on the rights of trans youth and trans people in general. And what is r rarely acknowledged is the problem of homelessness in Poland, especially of trans youth or uh, very young adults. Uh, a transgender child is often left on their own, very often not being able to voice their needs even to their parents. So we're still dealing with a lack of education also in terms of family. And the system, that is actually one of the most important things about Poland, is that uh, the system in Poland generally glorifies itself as absorbed with family issues and children's well-being. There's a lot of talk about family, what makes a family, and the tradition of family. But at the same time, the system does not have any answers, uh, any answers to the needs of trans children, trans youth, and trans families. Um, L'expression de genre et l'identité de genre, qui chez les personnes trans euh, peuvent ne pas être congruentes avec le genre assigné à la naissance, ne constitue pas des critères de discrimination au regard de la loi polonaise, euh, laquelle ne protège en théorie que les personnes trans qui ont obtenu la reconnaissance de leur changement de genre suite à une procédure légale et médicale que Victor va nous décrire. Et donc les personnes qui ne souhaitent ou ne peuvent pas passer par cette procédure ne bénéficient d'aucune forme de protection contre les discriminations, pour ne pas parler de la violence et des meurtres. 
Alors les trans en Pologne font donc face à des difficultés extrêmes, notamment au niveau du, du travail. Il y a notamment des difficultés à obtenir des, des certificats de travail adaptés quand on a fait une transition. Euh, également au niveau du logement, euh, le problème des, des trans sans abri, on n'en parle pas souvent, mais c'est un problème très réel en Pologne. Et naturellement, les, les jeunes trans euh, font face encore à de, de plus grandes difficultés, euh, ne pouvant pas s'exprimer euh, au sein de leur famille, euh, bien que dans une société qui se dit très, très préoccupée par les valeurs familiales. Euh, et euh, également, naturellement, à l'école où ils subissent du, du harcèlement. But for the sake of this presentation, because we're going to talk about um, all the aspects of the situation of trans people in Poland, let's try to make it a bit easier, a bit binary, and talk about these trans people in Poland who actually want to transition and who wish to undergo the necessary medical and legal steps to fulfill that goal. And let me tell you, they are in for a ride. That is not an easy process to go through. Changing a person's gender marker in Poland is not easy at all. It is a result of a court process based on a certain article of the Polish Civil Code, uh, which is not a trans law. There is no trans law in Poland. Everything that is happening in terms of legal recognition is based on court practice only and a certain interpretation of existing law. And this, uh, this civil court case that is happening is known as the assessment suit, which means that something needs to be assessed. And, uh, and at that time, when you use that to, to go through recognition, it is your gender that is assessed. And this means that an individual has to confront their parents in court. So it's a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit. So it doesn't mean that every, and nobody goes to jail. It doesn't mean that somebody pays a fine. It just means that you have to have two sides of an argument. And one of the, one of the sides is the person that wants to change their gender marker. The other side is their parents. And this need of having two sides of a legal argument uh, requiring somebody to literally file a lawsuit against their family is described by legal literature as the best possible compromise. That is how it's, how it's being um, described. Uh, when those regulations were formed, there was no possibility to introduce an administrative process due to Poland's complicated justice system. So it was, uh, at that time, the easiest way out to, to ensure that. Um, and the current procedure, however, seems to cause most, more trouble than it should uh, because it can actually even end in a negative judgment, denying a person the right to gender recognition because there actually is no standard. Every, uh, even though positive judgments have become somewhat of a standard, there are no regulations which would simply require a judge to check case documentation and issue a positive statement. Every single assessment suit is a fight for a person's identity and integrity because every single case is, a, is an actual court case. Um, changer le marqueur de genre en Pologne n'est vraiment pas facile. Uh, cela résulte d'une procédure uh, non pas administrative comme en Belgique, mais judiciaire, uh, lors de laquelle la personne uh, se voit contrainte d'assigner en justice ses propres parents, uh, même si elle est adulte. Cette procédure un peu surprenante est en fait due à la complexité du code civil polonais. La plupart du temps, le jugement est positif et donc le changement de marqueur de genre est accordé. Mais ce n'est pas systématique puisque c'est laissé à l'appréciation des juges. Et donc à chaque fois, la personne doit se battre pour son identité et son intégrité. This fight, however, does not begin in court. Everything begins at least a few months before one even manages to submit their documents to start the process. It begins with receiving the gateway to it all, which is a transsexual diagnosis. A transsexual diagnosis in Poland can be obtained through a series of tests and examinations, and that includes both psychological and, and physical testing and that includes uh, x-rays, karyotype check, a lot of the things that you would not even associate with gender. 
um, these gate, e even sometimes uh, EEG, which basically scans your brain waves. That else, that's if for some some sexologists that also counts as a legitimate way to check whether somebody is transsexual. Uh, those gatekeeping procedures are mostly aimed to check whether a person is able to transition, uh, and and this is and one of the most common elements of this method is what is called in literature the real life test. When one is forced to live full time as their preferred gender, uh, healthcare providers recommend a two year real life test during which one is not prescribed any hormonal treatment nor is one able to change their legal status. So it, it's, a, it's a void when you, when you are supposed to function uh, and get everything from society uh, that society will give you when you're, uh, when let's say you're not passing well. Um, but because of this incredible social and individual invasiveness, the real life test is being gradually withdrawn. So less and less um, diagnosticians actually use it. Uh, some use it in their practice, but some prefer to shorten it to a year, but still put a lot of focus on living in a preferred gender for some time, which is often described as making sure that the person knows what they're doing. And this can be seen especially problematic when one considers that it is a clear philosophy of <coughs> protecting people from themselves and the system knowing better than those who are me who are meant to use it and not being ruled by it. Donc on a, avant d'en arriver à cette euh, procédure de reconnaissance légale, la personne euh, doit d'abord euh, recevoir ce qu'on appelle un diagnostic de transsexualité euh, à l'issue d'une série d'examens euh, physiques, euh, psychologiques et psychiatriques qui sont destinés à vérifier si cette personne est bien à même de faire une transition euh, d'un rôle social de genre à l'autre. Et l'une des méthodes euh, consiste à imposer ce qu'on appelle un test de vie réel dans le genre souhaité, dont la durée peut varier, euh, durant lequel la personne euh, ne reçoit en général pas d'hormones et ne peut pas changer son statut légal. Donc il s'agit là manifestement d'un contrôle arbitraire du système sur les individus. Ce test de vie réelle est naturellement extrêmement invasif, socialement et individuellement, et donc il tend à être de moins en moins pratiqué, mais certains diagnosticiens continuent de l'utiliser pour établir le diagnostic. And apart from real life test, a person going through gender recognition in Poland is subjected to physical examination along with psychological and psychiatric evaluation. And after those are fulfilled, the diagnostician decides whether to prescribe hormones, but usually does so after the person has already been diagnosed as transsexual. So usually you have to have hormones to be diagnosed, uh, you have to be diagnosed as transsexual to receive hormone therapy. And it is possible to receive that treatment, hormonal treatment, without the diagnosis, but this practice might be problematic for further court procedures and is often discouraged in general practice because Um, during a court case, it can be actually put into question whether that was legitimate uh, action from the from the um, from the doctor's side. Uh, and it is also important to note that uh, no endocrinologist is involved in this process, and patients are rarely asked to present results or even undergo any hormonal testing to check pretreatment levels. So harm reduction practices are at their lowest when it comes to transgender health. In general. The Polish healthcare system is pretty bad. If um, if you will have the possibility to talk to any Polish people, you will definitely know that's one of the first items of conversation. Um, but it has been also reported that some providers do not inform their patients on the various possible side effects of hormonal treatment, and that includes uh, allergic reactions. Some specialists prescribe hormones without any knowledge on the issue, advising patients to inject themselves with testosterone every three days instead of customary two or three weeks. Transfusia has also recorded instances where trans women complain to their healthcare providers about emotional instability due to badly prescribed dosages and who were left with a uh, witty remark, <laughs> which, uh, which w the, the remark was, if you want to be a woman, you should accept these mood swings, it's normal. Uh, 
so this goes to the stereotypes that we were um, mm -hmm. talking about earlier. And this is why most uh, persons educate themselves on the subject them, themselves without any doctors or take their hormonal issues to other people in the community, not healthcare providers. The lack of uh, the lack of trust for these providers in Poland is is astonishing, to be honest. Uh, a transsexual diagnosis in Poland is still a question of discussion, both from a human rights perspective and the practical procedures surrounding it. Gender recognition is not only linked to giving in to a complete psychological and psychiatrical evaluation, uh, which in itself leads to self pathologization. Uh, but also to invasive medical procedures, and that includes surgeries and hormonal therapy. Hormonal therapy is mostly used for legal reasons. Feminization or masculinization is a confirmation for the court of a person's commitment to living in the preferred gender along with full medical documentation. So the, you have actually have this visual aspect that the court will actually um, um, try to, to see whether you are fitting in to the gender you want to become. Euh, la prescription d'hormones euh, survient en général après le diagnostic. Euh, il est possible d'en recevoir euh, sans ce diagnostic, mais comme cela peut compliquer la procédure de reconnaissance légale, euh, la pratique n'est pas encouragée. Ce traitement hormonal n'est pas, comme en Belgique, supervisé par un endocrinologue et les médecins euh, ne sont en général pas suffisamment formés, ce qui pose de gros problèmes en termes de santé. Euh, par exemple, les taux d'hormones avant et pendant ne sont pas mesurés. Il peut y avoir des effets secondaires ou des réactions allergiques et les surdosages sont monnaie courante. Aussi, la plupart des personnes trans préfèrent s'éduquer elles-mêmes euh, en ce qui concerne les hormones ou bien au sein de la communauté euh, plutôt que de faire confiance à des professionnels de la santé qui ne savent pas toujours ce qu'ils font et qui bien souvent ne les respectent pas. Euh, pour obtenir la reconnaissance légale, les personnes en transition <coughs> doivent être sous traitement hormonal euh, depuis plusieurs mois, donc euh, que ce soit dans le cadre d'une féminisation ou d'une masculinisation. Et pour les hommes trans, euh, l'opération du torse est par ailleurs requise, euh, bien qu'il y ait euh, apparemment des, des disparités à ce niveau entre l'Est et l'Ouest du pays, donc ce n'est pas systématique. Alors euh, précisons aussi qu'aucune euh, de, des chirurgies euh, lié euh, à la reconnaissance du genre et, et euh, généralement euh, aux transidentités euh, n'est remboursé par la sécurité sociale. Euh, donc outre ces, ces procédures médicales invasives, euh, les évaluations psychologiques et psychiatriques que les personnes trans doivent subir dans le cadre du diagnostic de transsexualité conduisent bien souvent à la pathologisation de soi-même, c'est-à-dire un, un sentiment d'être malade, d'avoir un problème. Et donc le diagnostic euh, soulève de nombreuses questions à la fois au niveau pratique et en, en termes de droits humains, comme euh, nous allons le voir dans la suite de la présentation. And also, um, there's a strict lack of legal regulations on gender recognition and causes irregularities. Uh, you've actually heard that in the in the translation already. Um, so to gain legal recognition as a woman, one has to undergo several months of hormonal therapy, but recognition of masculinity requires undergoing chest surgery. So this is like an even, uh, 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 totally uneven practice. Uh, and in this case, one could say that Poland is strictly divided into the West, which is uh, Wrocław and other regions, uh, where trans men are not forced to undergo any surgeries, and the East, which is Warsaw, and others where uh, chest surgery is often required before the court process can begin. Um, and chest surgery is labeled uh, as a condition for receiving the relevant documents needed for the lawsuit. So sometimes the doctor would actually force you to undergo chest surgery uh, on, the, uh, on the account that they will not give you the documentation needed for, for, the, um, for the legal case. Um, the procedure is not covered by the National Healthcare Plan, neither are any surger surgeries related to gender recognition which uh, in Poland is an important question to our cause and the way we work is that can, can actually a person afford their human rights and why should they pay for it? And we think that the gatekeeping system in Poland functions as a control mechanism. Uh, it's not only medical but also on an economic level. <laughs> it causes individuals to either abandon the process or to exist in a legal void, avoiding any social situations where the use of documentation is involved. We see that with our clients, we see that with the people we're working with. 
uh, and other people determined to find money for their surgeries are excluded from the same economic opportunities as the non-trans population. Uh, you, you, you see, for example, a lot of trans people from Poland going to other countries, working abroad, working on the black market just to be able to pay for their surgeries. In addition, trans people are quite frequently discriminated against in the labor market and in the workplace, which makes it difficult to find a profession that would match one's knowledge and experience. Not to mention that uh, there are no regulations that would force all employers to issue certificates of employment with new data. In other words, after even decades of hard working in a certain profession, one can end up without having any history of employment at all, unless they decide to disclose their transgender status, to which they have the full right to treat as private as they wish. Alors le, le système en Pologne, euh, comme on le voit, a agi comme un mécanisme de contrôle, euh, non seulement au plan médical, mais aussi au plan économique. Donc les, les personnes les plus défavorisées ou bien interrompent leur transition, euh, ou bien essayent de trouver de l'argent euh, par divers moyens, elles partent à l'étranger ou par le marché noir, euh, donc naturellement ça peut induire des, des comportements à risque. Euh, ou bien alors euh, elles essaient d'exister tant bien que mal dans, dans une espèce de vie de, de vie de légale euh, et euh, essayent d'éviter de, de, les situations où elles seraient amenées à, à présenter des documents d'identité ou des documents administratifs. Euh, les discriminations au travail euh, sont évidemment euh, très marquées euh, parce que rien n'oblige par exemple un, un ancien employeur à vous refaire un certificat de travail après la transition donc qui serait adapté. Et donc, euh, pour faire valoir euh, une expérience professionnelle euh, qui remonte parfois à plusieurs décennies, euh, eh bien, les personnes trans euh, sont obligées de, de dévoiler leur transidentité, euh, euh, ce qui est naturellement euh, tout à fait injuste. This is a picture of how the, pro the court process would look like. Um, so you have uh, you have the person that is the and I'm, I'm sorry, this is this is a new slide, but. I think it's going to be easy to, to add to the translation. Uh, so the person, the white person there, uh, uh, or the invisible person as I would like to call it rather than white, uh, is the person who goes through the, through the process. And then you have, the uh, it goes to the regional civil court. And then you have the par parents and, and or legal guardians, the, the gray sad people, that they are sad because they actually, if they're angry and sad, they can influence the process if they really want to. Um, they really want you to go through a bad process altogether. Um, so they are they are decided in that process. And once you go through the process, you have also uh, that smiley, smiley person has the expert witness. So this is the doctor that would actually evaluate you during the process. And then you have a verdict, which can be both good and bad. That's the, the general slide there. And because the Polish gatekeeping system, uh, it extends to the court process itself. So you go through a long and unpleasant diagnostic process. Uh, and this process uh, doesn't have to mean that you will be granted permission to, to change your gender marker uh, because of the, of the parents involved in the court. Uh, because of that, the procedure can be uh, irrationally prolonged, especially when the parents do not accept that your decision or the child's decision, the child being um, actually somebody who is already mature and adult, because uh, we actually done a research about this, and it turns out that the average age of going through recognition is about 21, so you have completely adult, mature, uh, mature people confronting their parents in court. So you can see that these measures do not confront with transgender human rights uh, standards at all, any human standards altogether. Uh, and the Polish court system does not educate its judges on the subject of uh, gender recognition. So uh, the court has to actually hear both sides. That is part of that process. Uh, and usually calls an expert witness, the, the smiley person on the, on the left. Uh, so it's another gatekeeping step. So you went through a diagnos diagnosis already, but you have another expert witness, another sexologist that will evaluate that first diagnosis. So as a, um, as a result, this process can take, uh, uh, it usually takes um, half a year, maybe a year. That depends because also you have to know that the courts in Poland work very slowly. It's a very slow process, especially when you have expert witnesses. There are not that many in the process. Uh, but sometimes it takes up to several years. 
we had a client in in Poland that had had that case for five years because different different witnesses kept coming and and etc. Um, and that is another reason to change these practices and to minimize the influence of third parties. So our general aim is to not have these people, not have not have all the people that uh, are on the sides. We want to only have this process like this. Um, and we also want to abolish any medical interventions as prerequisites, and, and that includes hormone therapy. Donc on voit que ce système de contrôle s'étend jusqu'à la procédure judiciaire euh, dont le résultat n'est jamais garanti même si on a reçu le fameux diagnostic de transsexualité. Euh, D'une part euh, les juges ne sont pas bien formés et donc euh, bah, comme on le voit sur euh, le, petit, le petit schéma, ils n'arrêtent pas de demander euh, des témoins, des expertises, des contre-expertises donc ça fait traîner la procédure en longueur. Et euh, comme euh, cette procédure comme on l'a vu euh, implique également les, les parents ou le tuteur légal, euh, eh bien, naturellement, si, si ceux-ci euh, ne sont pas d'accord avec le choix de leur enfant, euh, cela peut encore faire traîner les choses. Euh, et donc, euh, apparemment, une personne... D'habitude, ça prend à peu près un an, c'est ça euh, Ou même six mois. Enfin, une personne a vu le, son, son cas traîner jusqu'à cinq ans. Euh, voilà. Et euh, on, comme, comme la majorité des, des personnes qui font une transition, euh, comme ça semble être prouvé euh, par une étude, euh, sont, sont des adultes qui ont pour la plupart au-dessus de 21 ans, euh, bah donc euh, cette, euh, cette procédure qui fait intervenir des, des tiers, c'est tout simplement contraire aux droits humains. But there is one positive factor in all of this, uh, and the positive factor is that uh, changing one's gender marker is not linked to any sterilization procedures. But that actually um, is is not because of enjoyment of trans human rights. That is because Poland in general prohibits sterilization altogether. So even if you want to sterilize yourself for various reasons, you are unable to do it at all. So uh, trans people actually benefit from that law, uh, which, as you might imagine, is a result of uh, the Catholic Church lobbying in the in the 1990s. Um, and there's because there's actually an article in the Polish Criminal Code that it strictly forbids any any interference with persons' procreation abilities, unless it is because of important health reasons, uh, and which is actually very interesting. Being transsexual, which is currently a medical condition, is not among important health reasons to be sterilized. Uh, even though it's still viewed as a disorder and it, and it has to be diagnosed. So that is quite interesting how, how it works. Uh, and violation of this law can actually draw a, pers uh, draw a prison sentence up to 10 years. Uh, so needless to say, the system does not recognize nor encourage transgender parenthood. So we are in a very uh, interesting status where uh, it is impossible to become sterilized, but at the same time, there is no possibility to be recognized as a parent after you have transitioned. Um, and we're actually looking into having a case of a trans uh, transgender man pregnant. Um, so we're actually th thinking what, what, what will the law do? Um, and the wording used in the law that prohibits sterilization, it doesn't only ban sterilization, but also creates a broad space for interpretation, what it actually means to, to have procreation ability. Uh, and that also affects the question of mandatory chest surgery for trans men, which, as you have heard, is mandatory in some cases before legal recognition. And as a result, there is uh, a vicious circle created in which a person is required to undergo chest surgery, but some healthcare providers, some surgeons, refuse to carry out such an operation because they fear of the legal consequences in that law about procreation. And this situation drastically limits the offer of medical health to transgender people and creates a corruption-friendly environment. Un aspect positif euh, tout de même <rire> est que la stérilisation euh, n'est pas requise euh, euh, pour les personnes trans, donc euh, contrairement à la Belgique, précisons-le encore, euh, puisque le code pénal polonais euh, prohibe euh, strictement et punit parfois euh, jusqu'à de la prison euh, toute interférence avec euh, les capacités reproductrices de la personne. 
mais comme le, le terme n'est pas bien défini dans la loi, il est souvent pris au, au sens large et du coup ça a un effet un peu pervers, euh, notamment parce que certains praticiens refusent d'effectuer les opérations du torse qui sont pourtant parfois exigées pour les hommes trans. Euh, donc euh, ça, pose, euh, ça pose vraiment un problème euh, et, et ça pose un problème également en termes d'accès aux soins euh, euh, et euh, de plus cela, ça favorise euh, évidemment un, un climat propice à la corruption. So there's a question, uh, what do we do um, to change this? Uh, so you've heard all the bad news, uh, so it's, it's time to, to let you know that there are a number of initiatives to change the current situation and to move forward, uh, not only in human rights, uh, but also in general situation of trans people. And uh, one of the things that helped us throughout the last five years was the fact that, um, well, four years maybe, um, was the fact that our former president, Anna Grotska, was elected to the Polish parliament in 2011, uh, and thanks to that, uh, introduced a new and exciting possibility for transgender issues to be put in the spotlight on the, on the parliamentary agenda. And we achieved that in 2012 when uh, we have submitted a proposal of a new gender recognition law, which is called Gender Accordance Act. We've submitted that to the parliament, uh, with much controversy and media attention, as you can imagine. Um, and the draft law uh, contains a preamble which touches on the subject of basic human rights. Uh, it talks about dignity, freedom, physical integrity, modern knowledge on gender identity, and the evolution of interna international human rights standards, so it's packed with um, very high standards. Uh, the proposal states that a person willing to change their gender marker needs to present a statement of their, gen uh, of their gender identity, which is labeled as different from legal gender, so not opposite, but different, uh, and also a confirmation of this statement from a psychiatrist uh, or sexologist, and basically two healthcare providers have to be in that process. We couldn't get rid of the healthcare providers because we know that it would not pass if we would totally uh, scrap healthcare providers from that. And the document also forbids any medical intervention in the process that includes hormone therapy uh, as a prerequisite for recognition. So we want to have these two processes apart. We want to have the medical process uh, in its way and the, well, medical, if we exclude diagnosis, of course. And it is important to note that the law never mentions word rel uh, words related to transgender or transsexual. It talks about gender identity and the need to be recognized in your preferred gender, uh, which along with the already described concept of gender identity, which is in the preamble, hopefully will bring Poland closer to getting rid of the gender identity disorder diagnosis. We do not uh, introduce this now, but hope that it will be introduced later, maybe with a revision if it gets passed, that's the whole problem. Uh, and aim to put a lot of issues at ease, the proposal also ensures that a new birth certificate is created upon legal transition. That is currently not the case. We still uh, have old birth certificates if we transition. Uh, that also a parent never loses their parent status when transitioning and that all employers are forced by law to issue new certificates of employment to their employees, whether present or past. And to what is one of the most important facts, it introduces a new assessment process where it is only the claimant and the justice system without unnecessary guest appearances. So no more, no more expert witnesses, no more parents, nobody who would interfere. And it is also important uh, for our work is that um, out of four pure, pure LGBT draft laws, that were introduced in the parliament since 2011. There were three registered partnership proposals and the draft law on gender recognition. And that was all in 2013. It was only the trans agenda which made it through the political machine. So that's how it looks, um, what, is currently, what the parliament is currently working on. Uh, each and every registered partnership proposal fell under huge criticism and accusation of violating the Polish constitution um, because the Polish constitution apparently protects uh, marriage as a union between a man and a woman, which is actually not that, not that true, but that's a whole different uh, conversation. 
And the Gender Accordance Act uh, passed what is called in our circle, uh, circles constitutional test, which is like every LGBT related bill goes through this test because parliamentarians are keen on scrapping anything that goes against the constitution. And so there was the first reading in 2013 and the Polish parliament, the Polish same, uh, gave, uh, gave this proposal a chance to be worked further on with 224 24 votes for yes, that the parliament should work on it, and 198 votes opposing it. So you see, there's not that much difference in terms of what kind of emotions are with this law, um, but we're actually, we're, we were surprised that it passed, to be honest. Uh, and today it awaits its second reading while being refined and changed by a special subcommittee uh, in the parliament. And Transfusia holds an expert status within that committee. So we work hand in hand with uh, Anna Grotska and human rights lawyers to create an acceptable legal proposal which even though will definitely not be perfect, will ease all the trouble transgender people have to go through in Poland just so they can have their gender identities recognized by law. Eh bien, que, que fait Transfusia pour euh, changer la situation Alors tout d'abord, euh, suite euh, à l'élection de la première députée transgenre en Pologne, euh, Anna Grotska, qui est l'ancienne présidente de Transfusia, une, une proposition de loi euh, nommée euh, Gender Accordance Act a été introduite auprès du Parlement en 2012. Alors après un, un préambule sur les droits humains et les connaissances actuelles en matière d'identité de genre, euh, la proposition énonce qu'une personne qui souhaite changer son marqueur de genre euh, doit déclarer que son identité de genre est différente de celle de son genre légal. Euh, cette déclaration devant être confirmée euh, par un psychiatre euh, ou un, un sexologue. Euh, donc les personnes qui ont, qui ont rédigé cette proposition de loi euh, ont, sont bien conscientes que euh, si aucun euh, professionnel de santé n'était impliqué, ça n'aurait aucune chance de passer. Donc c'est pour ça qu'il faut qu'il y ait cette attestation euh, ou du psychiatre euh, ou du sexologue. Alors par contre, euh, aucune intervention médicale, y compris de, de traitement hormonal, n'est prérequise. La proposition est, est basée sur le concept d'identité de genre et ne mentionne aucun terme s'apparentant à, à transgenre ou transsexuel, ce qui est intéressant de, de noter. Euh, les, les, encore une fois, les, les personnes qui ont rédigé espèrent pouvoir ultérieurement euh, faire sauter euh, le, euh, le, le, ce qu'on appelle le, 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 le désordre de l'identité de genre, euh, mais ce sera, ce sera pour plus tard. Euh, alors, parmi les, les autres dispositions, il y a euh, l'émission d'un nouvel acte de naissance, le maintien du statut de parent, euh, l'obligation pour les employeurs de fournir un nouveau certificat de travail adapté à leurs employés, euh, qu'ils soient anciens ou, ou présents. Et euh, l'un des éléments les plus importants, comme on a vu euh, précédemment, euh, c'est qu'il s'agisse d'une nouvelle procédure de justice euh, sans intervention de tiers tels que les parents ou tous les experts euh, et autres euh, témoins. Alors, euh, il y a eu en fait quatre euh, propositions de, de loi euh, LGBT récemment, euh, euh, introduites auprès du, du Parlement, et ce, ce Gender Accordance Act euh, est la seule qui a passé le, le test constitutionnel, euh, celui-ci étant obligatoire pour euh, toutes les propositions de loi euh, estampillées LGBT. Donc les autres propositions euh, portaient sur des... Euh, des, par des, des partenariats civils, des unions civiles euh, pour les personnes de même sexe et celles-ci ont, ont toutes été retoquées euh, donc n'ont pas passé le, le test euh, constitutionnel euh, voilà, euh, les, les, les détracteurs euh, prétendent que, que c'est contraire à la constitution polonaise. Par contre le, le Gender Accordance Act a passé ce test euh, puis euh, une, euh, une première lecture euh, où on voit qu'il euh, a été accepté en première lecture, mais vraiment tout juste, hein, ça, ça, c'était très juste. Et donc, euh, pour l'instant, il est en attente en fait, d'une euh, deuxième lecture, donc euh, ça va se jouer... Euh... Any... Do you know when it's going to... That's actually uh, the question when is a very important question. Like, we're trying to actually push the commission to do it uh, in less than two months. 
So we're oh. steering them to do that in January. It could be pretty quick. Though. Hopefully, yes. Okay. Et donc, euh, euh, il y a donc un, 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 une espèce de sous-comité au Parlement qui est, qui est chargé d'examiner la, la proposition pour la, la deuxième lecture et puis sans doute un petit peu de la, de la remanier un peu. Et heureusement, Transoujia intervient en tant qu'expert au sein de ce comité et euh, naturellement euh, collabore euh, de près avec Anna Grotzka ainsi qu'avec des juristes spécialisés dans les droits humains euh, afin d'obtenir une loi euh, qui, euh, même si elle ne sera pas parfaite, euh, permettra tout de même de faciliter la reconnaissance légale du genre pour les personnes trans. And there are a number of other issues Transfusia is working on, uh, except for the Gender Accordance Act. Uh, we do a lot of uh, advocacy work, but apart from that, we provide support for trans people in, num in a number of ways because we're an advocacy-based and support-based organization, so we also work with the community. Um, we have a, con a counseling group uh, which offers psychological and social consultation. We offer legal aid, support groups almost all over Poland. We right now have uh, five different cities where our support group operate, uh, operate and we hope to have eight within the next year. Um, uh, we also, uh, this year, in cooperation with uh, Lambda Warsaw, we are open, uh, opening an LGBT homeless shelter, which is going to be a, a Uh, pretty much aimed for trans people, no, not only trans people, but trans people are our main target, obviously, in that. Uh, and this homeless shelter is not going to be just a shelter, but it's going to be aimed to integrate people back to society, so they're going to have a limited time to be there and to work on their situation, get a job, and, and move out to, to help them come back to, the, to, to society. Our resources are mediocre, to be honest, and we are very often overworked, working 12 hours a day, working weekends, but I think that's a general situation of trans activists everywhere. And sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, weeks without end, but we know that changing one life can make a huge difference, and that means changing, changing making a huge difference now and in the future. And with our advocacy work, we were uh, we tried to get involved in as many meaningful initiatives as we can. Uh, we maintain and create coalitions both in Poland and abroad. We argue for gender identity and gender expression as valid discrimination grounds. Uh, we advocate for the introduction of a hate crime and hate speech law that would finally rec recognize transgender people and transgender in general as a sensitive topic. And with every year, we try to underline that trans lives matter and that even the smallest group deserves basic respect and that this respect does not manifest in just leaving people alone. You have to help these people and you have to help us. We need, we need society's help to, to be able to thrive also. And we also believe that respect for vulnerable groups is achieved by solidarity and basic understanding. So that's what we're also aiming for when we work. We also work with education and we believe that these are the first steps to enjoyment of human rights by everyone, that we respect and understand each other. Alors, donc, euh, outre l'action au niveau euh, législatif et euh, la sensibilisation au, au discours et au, au crime de haine, euh, les, les autres activités de Transfugia sont euh, d'une part le soutien des personnes par des consultations psychosociales et de l'aide légale. Euh, il y a également euh, des groupes de support au niveau local dans toute la Pologne et apparemment ceci se, se multiplie, il y en a de plus en plus. Et il y a également, en collaboration avec une autre structure, un projet de centre d'accueil pour euh, les personnes LGBT sans abri et apparemment euh, c'est tout particulièrement destiné aux, aux personnes trans sans abri parce que comme on l'a déjà dit c'est vraiment un, un gros problème et euh, Transfugia participe aussi à des, des coalitions euh, au niveau national et, et international donc euh, essaye de s'impliquer dans le plus possible d'initiatives à tous les niveaux alors évidemment euh, il y a des difficultés euh, ben, le peu de moyens, d'une part, et euh, alors une charge de, de travail euh, considérable pour, euh, pour les personnes euh, impliquées dans, dans l'association, donc euh, avec euh, du travail, euh, des, des très longues journées, on travaille le week-end. Euh, mais bon, euh, l'association voilà, est consciente qu'il faut continuer, euh, parce que même changer juste une vie peut faire la différence, et donc euh, elle, elle œuvre vraiment sans relâche pour, euh, pour les droits humains des, des personnes trans, parce qu'elle sait que son action fera faire la différence aussi bien aujourd'hui qu'à l'avenir.
Merci. Merci.